Okay, so I guess we can start again. Welcome back, everyone. So apologies in advance. I kind of half lost my voice. So um, let's see how it goes. Um, so this is just a brief recap of what we learned yesterday, yeah, the most important parts. So we realized that um, one generic way to produce dark matter is by these kind of processes, keeping dark matter particles uh, in equilibrium with standard model particles. Yeah? So I just use a generic particle psi here. This is any heat bath particle. Yeah? And I say standard model particle, but in reality we've only used that it's a particle that is in equilibrium. So this could also be some beyond standard model physics particles that have been in equilibrium early in the universe, yeah, before the electric phase transition, for example. But it could also be um, a completely secluded dark sector uh, heat bath, and then the entire story would work the same way. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so this keeps us in equilibrium and really in full chemical equilibrium, um, because this is a number changing processes until at some point um, we freeze out yeah, and leave chemical equilibrium. Yeah, so this is basically defined by um, saying that the effect of the Hubble um, expansion, yeah, so the expansion rate is roughly the same as the rate for this process. Yeah, so that's what we discussed in the Boltzmann equation when the two regimes um, take over or change. Yeah, and the observable connected to this is the dark matter density, and that's, as I argued, is the one thing we really know about dark matter, the cosmological uh, density. And, well, looking at the, like solving the equation, um, we found that the dark matter density basically only depends on the ratio or on the, on the cross-section, you know, on the annihilation cross-section. So that can be re-expressed as a ratio of coupling to dark matter or mass. Yeah, and then this sort of WIMP miracle just refers to the fact that, for example, weak interactions um, satisfy this ratio here. Yeah, and then would give you generically the correct relic density. Yeah, now, in detail, yeah, before we leave, uh, or when we start to leave equilibrium, the detailed evolution is given by the Boltzmann equation. Yeah, and I try to stress that this is um, like an analytic result, yeah? so in particular the um, annihilation rate here is it's the thermally averaged annihilation rate, and in principle this is a like six-dimensional phase-based uh, integral, but you can reduce it to a single integral over the center of mass energy. And there's one, I mean there are always several assumptions, but one that is decisive, and that is this one. Yeah? So you assume in the derivation meaning that it's an assumption that you really need, have to satisfy in order to use that equation, that the uh, phase space density of dark matter is of this form. Yeah, so in other words, it looks like a thermal distribution of a non-relativistic particle, it's a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, with an arbitrary normalization, which you can in interpret as a, um, as a chemical potential, so a time, de a time or temperature dependent chemical potential, but in any case, a prefactor that does not depend on the momentum anymore. So that's the assumption. Um, and this is what we will get back, back to now, where this assumption comes from and situa discuss situations where it is violated. Um, so the other thing that I stressed is that in this kind of discussion, in principle, this is an extremely predictive framework because this kind of diagram here, also when you turn it around, uh, would give you all kinds of detectional prospects. And uh, in the vanilla case, so if you actually parameterize the annihilation cross-section just with two numbers, so just the mass scale and um, the coupling, it's a scenario that is actually ruled out. Yeah? So you need, for, I mean, for these kind of interaction strengths, you would today expect signals that we don't see. Yeah? But the reason this is not ruled out is that very generically, this value here that sets the relic density is not the same that we would observe today for various reasons. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so now let's get back to this one. And this is connected to what is known as kinetic decoupling. Uh, so it's essentially the same diagram as that one, just turned around. So remember, time always goes from 
left to right. Um, so if we have instead the scattering of dark matter particles on um, heat bath or plasma particles, yeah, then as I mentioned briefly yesterday already, this is something that, I mean, generically you would say that uh, the um, amplitude is the same, yeah, but the rate of this process is much larger than this one because these here have a, an exponentially suppressed number density, they're non-relativistic, while those haven't. Yeah, so that means that um, this process is basically responsible for keeping the dark matter particle in uh, kinetic equilibrium yeah, until some, again, yeah, until at some point these processes or the rate of these processes will also fall behind the Hubble rate and then there's not even kinetic equilibrium anymore until some, so let's call it XKD for kinetic decoupling. Uh, and this is generically much, much larger than um, the freeze-out temperature, the chemical decoupling. Um, okay, so then the question is, what kind of observable can you relate to that? Yeah, just as here, the chemical decoupling is related directly to the dark matter density. Yeah, there's an intrinsic observable in principle related to that, and that is the size of the smallest density perturbations that we have. size of smallest density perturbations, which will eventually collapse into, into structures. So these are the pro smallest halos or proto-halos. Yeah, so why is that? Well, as long as you have efficient scatterings, yeah, so far we've only talked about uh, homogeneous cosmology. Yeah, we've used the friedman robson walker uh, element but of course we want to describe a universe that is not exactly homogeneous. So the way this works in cosmology is that you basically do a perturbation theory, so very similar to what you do for gravitational waves. Uh, but now we're looking at scalar perturbations yeah, on top of the friedman robertson walker background. Yeah, so and in order to explain all the structures that we see today, uh, the, um, what, what we understood then, what we learned from, from analyzing these equations is that we, it suffices to start with a really very, very homogeneous uh, initial universe that is inhomogeneous only to one part in about 10 to the, 10 to the 5. Yeah, so we add tiny initial perturbations and then let them evolve under the effect of gravity. Yeah, so, of course, gravity is always attractive. So when you have a small spatial overdensity, uh, compared to an average density, it will collapse, so it will attract more matter and therefore grow in size. Yeah? However, this kind of picture, since we start with really, I mean, only tiny perturbations, far in the linear regime, is completely disturbed if we have active scatterings. Yeah? If we scatter on something that is a radiation component, which cannot gravitationally cluster, yeah, any initial um, density perturbation will immediately be washed out. So that means on these small scales, early in the universe, yeah, there's no chance for density perturbations to grow. Yeah, and uh, more concretely, there are two independent effects. Yeah, one is what I basically just said in words. So whenever you have a pert uh, perturbation on a length scale that is smaller than sound horizon, these processes um, prohibit the growth of density perturbations. So no growth of density perturbations. On scales smaller than the sound horizon. Yeah, so the sound horizon is basically just the Hubble horizon times the um, speed of sound. Yeah, so the Hubble horizon is really you integrate from t equal to zero until then the time of kinetic decoupling. <coughs> so this and cs is the speed of sound. But then at the point when dark matter decouples, 
kinetically. There's another effect that um, prohibits the growth of density perturbations, and that is free streaming. Yeah, so this is something that you know from neutrinos. It's the main reason why neutrinos can't be dark matter. So just because, I mean, these uh, dark matter particles will have some, uh, will inherit some um, velocity dispersion from the scattering with the heat bath particles yeah, until they decouple. And that means they will just freely stream out of under dense, uh, of over dense regions. Yeah, and that is an integrated effect starting from the time of kinetic decoupling. And then it's a model dependent um, question, which one of those suppressions dominates? So wash out of density perturbations. <clears throat> on scales lambda größer, larger than the free streaming length, which is, um, well, you have to integrate from the point of kinetic decoupling until, well, roughly matter domination or, I mean, um, like conceptually the point at which um, dark matter or density perturbations start to become nonlinear, so at the point when you really start structure formation. Um, of the average velocity. And you just have to be sure that, I mean, you have to include factors of A to make sure that you talk about um, well, co-moving or physical length scales respectively. Now, so these are the effects that suppress structure on small scales, meaning that in principle, there's a one-to-one -one relation between the point of kinetic decoupling or temperature of kinetic decoupling and the smallest scales that we can, or the more, smallest substructures that we can have uh, in the universe. Yeah, so if we were to observe a, um, a cutoff in the spectrum of matter density perturbations, yeah, this would tell us just as much about dark matter as the observation of the relic density. Yeah, so unfortunately, we don't see, at least not undisputed, any such um, cutoff, but in principle, it's a powerful tool. Okay, so how do we, study this. Um, it turns out that, um, well, just if you think about how we arrived at this equation, you know, we started from the full Boltzmann equation at the phase space level, and then essentially only considered the zeroth moment of it. Yeah, so we just integrated over all of the momenta, and then this is the Boltzmann equation integrated over all of momenta. You know, to study the kinetic decoupling, in most situations, it's sufficient to do something similar. You know, of course, we want to consider something that conserves uh, the number density, unlike this one. You know, so this one will not give us any um, reasonable constraint. Um, but it's sufficient to just consider the next moment of the Boltzmann equation. Yeah, so in other words, we try to derive a Boltzmann equation that is not for the number density, but for the velocity dispersion. So it's sufficient to consider. And then the velocity dispersion, well, in, in equilibrium, in local equilibrium, the velocity dispersion is just the temperature. Yeah, so what I do is to introduce a parameter that is basically proportional to the velocity dispersion and which reduces to the temperature in the limit where we still have kinetic equilibrium. So, and well, we're considering, I mean, in general, yeah, for a um, thermal distribution, this expression here will reduce to, a, uh, to the temperature. But for us, this is, I mean, don't interpret this as a temperature, it's just a parameter defined by this averaging. Yeah, so, what do I mean by this averaging? Well, I just have to integrate over the entire um, phase-based distribution. <clears throat> yeah, so just as yesterday, I only integrated directly over it, then I get the number density, and now I integrate over this expression, and then find that, well, this is by definition for a, um, Thermal distribution, uh, this is just the temperature. 
So for um, large temperatures, that means larger than kinetic decoupling. And on the other hand, um, if we consider later times, so smaller temperatures, what happens then? Well, we are not in equilibrium anymore, yeah, but we start somehow with some typical momentum P. And since the collision operator is effectively zero, we just have redshift. Yeah, so we know that since this is um, scales like P squared, then we're in the highly non-relativistic limit. So E is just the mass. Yeah, so that means that this temperature here just scales like um, A to the minus two. So this is just some constant divided by A to minus two for T smaller than the kinetic decoupling temperature. And I assume here that we have non-relativistic dark matter. Yeah, so remember that we already chemically decoupled at non-relativistic um, temperatures. So the kinetic decoupling is even at much smaller temperatures. So it turns out that when you uh, study the Boltzmann equation, yeah, we will do that, um, that this transition between the two regimes is typically very, very quick. Yeah, so that allows you to actually define um, this transition as the point of kinetic decoupling. So you basically just equate these two asymptotic um, solutions. Yeah, so we just define this as um, well, the point of kinetic decoupling. Um, and then use the red shifting. Um, okay, so then let's take a look at the Boltzmann equation. Yeah, so we can introduce a collision operator for the second moment, yeah, which, yes? From this one to this? Yes, so, so this was a, just a very generic argument. Yeah, so I basically say that, okay, so if you um, plot the this parameter here as a function of a. Yeah? Then I say that, okay, at very early times, or let's, um, what do I want to do? I want to plot this as, yeah, okay, so, so t is roughly proportional to one over a. Yeah? So then I know that at, um, It changes the slope, exactly. I just can't decide in which plane I want to plot the whole thing. So let's plot it like this, t over t. Yeah. So at very early times, yeah, by definition, since this is a thermal distribution, this parameter will be exactly uh, t. Yeah, so this is exactly one. Yeah, so that means at early times, as long as I'm in equilibrium, it stays exactly one. Sorry? T is the temperature of the plasma. Yes, T is the temperature of the plasma always. Yeah? So this is really by definition of this being a thermal distribution. You, know, you can check, like if you insert a um, uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution here, this is exactly what you get. Yeah? So we're assuming that we have uh, non-relativistic dark matter. And then I don't know maybe what happens here, but I know that once I'm completely decoupled, you know, there's nothing that keeps me in equilibrium. I know that the scaling must be like this. Yeah, in other words, the ratio yeah, must scale like one over A. Here? Or? Um, no, because, yeah, I mean, th that, that's why I <laughs> couldn't decide which ratio to plot. So this is an exact ratio. Yeah, but then you remember that the relation between T and A is not exactly um, that they are inversely proportional to each other because it's also the number of degrees of freedom in the plasma that enter. Yeah, so it's the temperature, uh, sorry, it's the, the entropy density that is conserved. Yeah, so this is an exact one. 
And here I just know that it's, it's not intrinsically related to T, but intrinsically related to the redshift. So this is just an effect of the expanding universe. Yeah, so I know that this must go like 1 over A. Uh, and then I'm just saying that, okay, let me draw it here. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just saying that I define now my time of kinetic decoupling as the point where these two meet, these two asymptotic curves. And then, as an additional information, I tell you that when you actually solve the full Boltzmann equation, you find something that looks very similar. Yeah? So it's, of course, a smooth transition, but on a very short time scale, meaning that this is a very useful definition of the time of kinetic decoupling. Yes, but I check explicitly that it is a smooth process. So, I mean, this definition is based on the assumption that it is a, a fast process. Yeah, so I I'm, I'm just extrapolate these. I mean, I, I have two asymptotic regimes that I know exactly. Yeah, and then that is what I use to define the point of connected coupling. And then when I actually solve the differential equation to describe this even in this complicated regime, I see that it is actually a change between the slopes on a very short time scale or temperature scale. <clears throat> okay, so let's introduce this um, collision operator here now for the second moment. Yeah, so um, I introduce it like this. Yeah, so this is the collision operator um, at the phase space level, and as before, I want to divided by the energy. Yeah, that's what I did for the number density. So now I add this additional factor. And then of course you know that, well, because we have the Boltzmann equation, this will form the second moment of the collision operator must correspond to the second moment of the Liouville operator. Yeah, so this should be the same as d3p by 2 pi 3 and then our Liouville operator. Uh, times this one, um, so p squared over 3e dt minus p dp, sorry, h, and then let's me, let me again write it in this 3D version, acting on f. Um, okay, so then I can use a similar trick as uh, last time. Yeah, so the temperature is uh, sorry the, the time is an independent variable, so it commutes with the with the momentum. So I can pull this outside the integral, and then you see that um, this combination here, p squared by three e times f, integrating over, is just how I defined my uh, temperature parameter. Yeah, so this is a dt. And now I have to be careful because in the definition there's also the n, the number density. So it's an n times t chi. Yeah, so, I mean, the important thing here is that I really did not make any assumptions about f. I'm just using a definition of t chi. So don't be misled by this capital T in thinking that I somehow assumed this has a thermal distribution. Yeah, it's really, I mean, if you find this confusing, think of the t rather than a velocity dispersion. It's an independent parameter for us now. Um, okay, so then I have another term minus h uh, g d 3 p 2 pi 3 and then there is a um, p squared 3 e um, p nabla p f uh, and for this term I can again do the same trick as last time. So I use partial integration, uh, meaning that I basically change the sign here and then the derivative operator acts to the left. Uh, and then you see what, what happens. Well, first of all, we are in the highly nanotivistic regime. Yeah, so this, uh, I can just take the energy to be the mass. 
Yeah, I mean, of course, I can take next order terms in the expansion that would be suppressed by p squared by e squared. Yeah, so then there are two terms. So this um, the partial derivative with respect to p acts on p squared and on p vector. Yeah, and then this acting on this as in the uh, derivation of the um, number density gives just a factor of three. And then I have another term acting on this, that's a two. Uh, so what I then find is that we have an n dot, or let me write it slightly. Let me write everything as a function or pull out an overall factor of n. So from this term we get two terms here, t dot plus n dot over n t chi. And then this term here is a um, 5h t chi plus higher orders. Yeah, so like note that after you act with the derivative on p, you again have a form that only evolves my definition of the temperature parameter. Okay, so then we can use our knowledge from before. Namely, we can use the um, fact that kinetic decoupling happens much later than uh, chemical decoupling. So we're describing an era of the evolution where the n dot is actually given by the collisionless Boltzmann equation of, um, for the number density. Uh, so this one, in other words, is equal to minus 3h if um, x kinetic decoupling is indeed larger than x chemical decoupling. Yeah, so that means that this is of a relatively simple form. And then it just remains to calculate the, I mean, actually the collision operator. Yeah. Uh, in the last uh, line, uh, 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 yeah, so, I mean, see where it comes from. So, this acts on the product of p squared times p. Yeah, the Nabla acting on p gives a factor of 3. And the Nabla acting on p squared gives a factor of 2 times p, which is contracted with, HP, with this p. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay, so then we want to consider two to two elastic scattering. And well, for that, our full collision operator now is given by this expression. Yeah, so K and K twiddle are the um, standard model or heat bath momenta. And then I denote with P twiddle the momentum of the other dark matter particle. Yeah, so remember that in the Boltzmann equation you always have uh, like an explicit dependence on the momentum of uh, the particle that you want to describe. So the P that enters in the Liouville operator. And then the P twiddle is the other um, dark matter particle, like the final state of the scattering process. And then we have momentum conservation. And the scattering amplitude.
And now we need to take into account um, like spin statistic factors, yeah, at least for the uh, heat bath particles, yeah, because they have uh, large occupation numbers. Um, so that means that we have an F bar psi of omega F chi F psi omega twiddle F e twiddle minus and then the other way around Yeah, so you always have uh, like scattering processes. Yeah, this is like the scattering process um, that depletes uh, the phase space density for a given energy. Yeah, the energy here without the twiddle is the one that we want to solve for. Yeah, so that means this is the initial dark matter particle scattering on a um, standard model or heat bath particle with energy omega. And then this has a final state suppression or enhancement. And this is the opposite process in the opposite direction. Okay, and then this is a bit more involved actually than the gondologian mini derivation. So I just try to again um, stress what is uh, used then to simplify this um, phase space integral here. Yeah, so one is that you can use the fact that in the highly random relativistic limit, yeah, the momentum transfer will always be small. Yeah, so if you scatter two non relativistic particles with each other, the momentum transfer is small, yeah, just kinematically. Um, then we also use that we are in the non-relativistic expansion, in the non-relativistic limit. And then you can show that this can be written. Yeah, so it again can be reduced to a single integral. So let me first just give you the full expression and then I can explain it a bit. Okay, so what do we have here? Um, in this expression, E and P are just the energy and momentum of the dark matter particle. Um, this gamma here, yeah, this is the so-called momentum transfer rate. And this is also given by a just analytic expression, and that's where the one remaining integral enters. 48 pi cubed, gm cubed, d omega, f psi, d omega, k to the four, and then the average matrix element. Yeah, so, okay. This is the energy over just one of the heat bath particles. That's what you integrate over. And this is the matrix element for the scattering process averaged over um, the momentum exchange. There's a question. Yeah, so... so so, so basically, we're just assuming that this is satisfied. Okay. Yeah, because we have dark matter. Yeah, and we, if we have non relativistic dark matter, and if this wasn't satisfied, we would overclose the universe. Yeah, so that's the one thing we know independently of the um, production mechanism, as long as we're talking about non relativistic dark matter. Yeah, late enough. Yeah, so that's a very generic answer. Um, okay, so this is the matrix element averaged over these small momentum transfers. Yeah, and this is um, related to what is known as the transfer cross-section, in case you've seen that. Um, yeah, so, like this. Yeah, this is known as the transfer cross-section. Yeah, so it's basically a moment, um, well, an angle average, uh, if you wish. Um, that you really, uh, so, so, you, so you punish forward scattering um, somehow. 
So technically, it's two integrals that are left because you have one integral over t uh, to do the averaging. Um, okay. So what's important here is that this here is the momentum transfer rate that enters parametrically and not the scattering rate. Yeah, so this is not the scattering rate. Yeah, which you might naively think, uh, because in the corresponding Boltzmann equation for the number density, you just had directly the annihilation rate. Uh, and the momentum transfer rate is related to, a, to the scattering rate by another factor of m by t. So a large factor, since we are considering uh, large x. And the reason is that we want to describe the process of bringing us back into local equilibrium. Yeah, but of course, you change significantly the number density with only one annihilation process. But since we have only, um, like kinematically, small momentum transfers, you need to have many scattering processes in order to bring you back into local equilibrium. Yeah, so what is really happening is that um, you perform a random walk in momentum space. Yeah, and like of course, the scatterings can both increase and decrease the momentum or the velocity dispersion. Yeah, and if you are displaced from equilibrium, it will take more time to get you back to the equilibrium distribution. So that's the reason why parametrically you need a um, larger rate than the scattering rate to bring you back in equilibrium. Um, okay, and then, well, this is really the, the full expression at the phase space level. Then you can again um, integrate over this um, Thing here, yeah, so you have like this integral to give you the um, second moment of the collision operator. Uh, and if you do that, you find a Boltzmann equation of this form. Uh, so we take the left hand side, divide by n. So then what we are left with ha here is a two time derivative of this temperature parameter plus two h t chi, uh, that's what we have there. And then this here is of a relatively simple form. Okay, so this is an analogy to the equation for the number density. Yeah? And you should interpret this in a simple, uh, similar way. Yeah? First of all, there's a different factor here. Um, two instead of three, and that is related to this sketch here. Yeah? So even um, at early time, so even if this vanishes, oh sorry, even, even if the right-hand side vanishes, yeah, this, the temperature parameter does not just scale like, um, does not dilute like the number density. Yeah? So there's a different um, slope here than for the uh, number density. Um, Apart from that, you see that there's also a, um, a fixed point of the evolution of, the, um, um, of this temperature parameter t chi here. Yeah, so basically, um, the same argument as for the number density of the, dis the discussion of the equation for the number density. So assume that the, act the, the dark matter temperature is slightly higher than the background temperature, but that you have a large rate here. Yeah, so if it's slightly higher, multiplied by a large number, you get a large positive factor on the right-hand side. And by large, I mean compared to the Hubble rate. Yeah, so that means that um, the time derivative, the change of um, t chi, is positive. Yeah, so, do I get this correct? Um, so I started with something that is... Yeah, that is smaller, right? So then this is positive, so the change is positive. Um, so the, um, the dark matter temperature will increase. Yeah? And the other way around, if it's larger, it will decrease. Yeah? So in other words, this kind of behavior has an explicit fixed point, a manifest fixed point, that drives you towards the equilibrium solution, with a, which is t equal to t chi. Yeah? And on the other hand, if you sort of look at the solution after freeze out, yeah? so that, I mean, if gamma is larger than H, yeah, this is exactly this regime here. Um, so you're forced to be in the equilibrium solution. 
while this is the regime where you can neglect uh, gamma, the momentum transfer rate. And if you just solve this one, you will find this redshift dependence as desired. Yeah, so what you have to do is really to calculate from your basic scattering amplitude and the given um, uh, particle physics model, the momentum transfer rate, and then use this here to calculate the time of kinetic decoupling. Um, okay, so what do you find then? That, I mean, you can translate that to the cutoff mass uh, in, the, in the spectrum of matter density perturbations and do this for typical WIMP models. So, for example, for um, neutralinos, which you can take as a um, well, benchmark for general WIMPs, this is in this range here uh, for neutralinos. Uh, so, when I say for neutralinos, for neutralinos that have the right relic density. Here you see several things here. A, there's a significant model dependence. Yeah, so sometimes, I mean, particularly in slightly older literature, you read that this, um, uh, the size of these um, halos, the smallest halos that you can have in a WIMP model, is Earth size. And the reason for that is uh, that the first um, people looking at kinetic decoupling, uh, they did not actually derive this kind of equation, but just took a benchmark model and estimated the size of the, of the proto-halo mass. And for a 100 g Beano-like particle, you have indeed Earth mass, which is 10 to the minus 6 solar masses. Yeah, but in general, there's a significant model dependence, yeah, which shouldn't so, should surprise you because this scattering diagram here, the, the matrix element, is for scattering, yeah, while the, um, the, the amplitude squared that sets the relic density is for annihilation. And of course, if you have a vanilla wimp, it should be roughly the same, so it should be only one number. But in a complicated, more realistic model like supersymmetry, the two are not related. And that's just the other side of the coin of what I said initially, that in principle, if we were able to observe this, it would give us a completely independent handle on the, uh, on the nature of dark matter. Yeah, so it's a really an independent input. Um, so this is just one model class. You can actually increase it significantly. So this is like beyond what you could hope to observe. Yeah? So like cosmological simulations, for example, uh, go down to something like 10 to the 3 solar masses or so. So that's the point mass limit. And observationally, uh, we are very far away from that. I mean, to, to resolve um, what, um, I mean, the cutoff in, in the spectrum of matter density perturbations uh, to resolve even what, what we can do numerically. Yeah, but for a different model class, you can actually get close to the limit um, that we can observe, and you can even use it to constrain models. Yeah, so in particular, we can get very large late kinetic decoupling, which corresponds to large cutoff masses, so late that you would even prevent the formation of dwarf galaxies. Yeah, and this happens for two classes of models. Yeah, so this would be roughly the, uh, the scale of uh, dwarf galaxies. So one is if you have TV scale dark matter candidates with MEV scale mediators. Yeah, so then, like the scattering diagram is something like this. You have a mediator A, you have a TV scale, TV scale dark matter particle, uh, uh, and that means that um, just because the mediator is so light, you know, the scattering is really much more efficient than the annihilation. Um, chi, chi, psi, psi. Yeah, remember, kinematically, the T is small, uh, so that means the T-channel propagator gives an enhancement of this, um, um, of this kind of diagram. So that's one option, uh, and you can constrain in that way these kind of models, even if the Psi lives in a completely dark sector. That's uh, one of these interesting examples where you have a completely secluded uh, sector that would describe dark matter, and yet you can have actual astrophysical constraints um, that exclude part of the parameter space. Um, the other, like more traditional option, is to have warm dark matter. Uh, so if we have KEV 
style ordinary warm dark matter, yeah, for example, an ordinary neutrino, yeah, then we get also these uh, large um, uh, cutoff masses. And that's sort of the more familiar case uh, and the reason why, um, well, why neutrinos, which clearly are lighter than this, cannot make up um, all of the dark matter. Okay, so let's maybe take a short break, 10 minutes break, um, and then I give some more example of when it becomes sort of exceptions to this standard story that we can really treat the chemical decoupling and the chemical decoupling completely separate. Yeah, and then we start to look at alternative production scenarios. <clears throat> Okay, so let's start again. <laughs> ah, right. <clears throat> okay, so I mean, in what we discussed before the break, yeah, I argued that generically you will always have kinetic decoupling happening much later than chemical decoupling. Just a kinematic argument, yeah, just because you have many more um, particles in the initial state here. Yeah, so the scattering rate or the momentum transfer rate that is more relevant will be much larger um, here than there. Yeah, but there are actually exceptions. And what does that mean? Well, it means that you cannot treat the evolution of the number density and the velocity dispersion slash temperature independently. Yeah, so in particular, it means that you cannot use this um, standard approach to the Boltzmann equation, because remember that this one assumed that we are in kinetic equilibrium. Yeah, we assumed that here, um, that the phase space density of dark matter is just proportional to a Boltzmann distribution, yeah, which is motivated by kinetic equilibrium. So in general, what you will have to do here, you can, you can still use this kind of exp expression, but you have to modify your thermal average, meaning that you should effectively here use the, this dark sector temperature parameter, T chi, to calculate the thermal average. Yeah, so to a good approximation, in other words, what you want to do in this situation, you need to solve a coupled system of Boltzmann equations for the number density and for the um, dark matter disp um, velocity dispersion. So coupled equations for n chi and t chi. Now, of course, that's an approximation. It works surprisingly well in many, many situations. But if even that breaks down, there, there's no way around to solve the Boltzmann equation directly at the phase space level. Uh, which is much more involved. So let me just give you some examples where this is, or models where this is relevant. Um, so one model class are so-called Sommerfeld enhanced models, uh, where you need to take into account um, non-perturbative effects. Uh, so in particular, if this is near a parametric resonance, yeah, so you have to somewhat tune the parameters of the model. Yeah, so what happens there? Well, it's exactly the kind of model that I 
um, mentioned before, so you have a dark matter particle that can annihilate into some mediator, A, uh, it can be a complete dark sector model, and the mediator is somewhat smaller than the dark matter mass, uh, not too much smaller, um, but then because the um, um, because of the kinematic situation, so in, for a non-relativistic particle, the momentum transfer is always small. Um, and then it turns out that, like, if you, if you add something like this to the diagram, you, know, you would naively say that, um, well, this diagram compared to the original, to the tree-level one, is suppressed by two orders of the coupling constant. Uh, but in fact, because you add this in the heat channel, it's suppressed, in quotation marks, by a factor of alpha from the coupling divided by the velocity of the dark matter particles. Meaning that you can actually add more and more of these uh, ladder rungs and not have a perturbative expansion anymore. So in that sense, it's non-perturbative. Um, and then the cross-section times velocity in, I mean, if you choose um, like the dark matter mass and the couplings correspondingly, then in this kind of situation, the cross-section has an expansion like this. Yeah, so you get a very strong enhancement for very small velocities. Um, well, and then, if, if you think about, I mean, what this does for uh, this one and how the, um, well, how the velocity, we, we check that the velocity after kinetic decoupling yeah, that should just redshift. Yeah, so then that can be translated into a temperature dependence of the um, thermally averaged annihilation rate. Uh, and you can compare that to the temperature dependence of both the H and of the Ns. Yeah, and then you arrive at the funny situation that you can have in this kind of model ordinary freeze out, kin uh, kinetic chemical decoupling. Yeah, then you have something that looks like kinetic decoupling. But after kinetic decoupling, the velocity redshifts with the expansion of the universe. It's not kept in thermal equilibrium anymore. And then the annihilation rate grows so fast that it capture, um, catches up with the Hubble rate again. So there's a second era of annihilations in these kind of models. Yeah, so. And that's exactly a situation when you really need to track the velocity dispersion and the dark matter density at the same time and solve a coupled um, system of equations for this. Yeah, so just to complete the, the argument here, then correspondingly, the scattering uh, is of the type um, that I mentioned before. And since we have, I mean, we're looking at uh, relatively light uh, mediators, we get also late kinetic decoupling, later than in the um, standard case. So another situation that is in some sense even more generic is if we have narrow resonances. Yeah, so the most, um, I mean, the, the simplest dark matter model that you could imagine is that um, the dark matter particle um, is just a scalar singlet. Yeah, so you are just at a real scalar to the standard model. Yeah, and then the only thing you can, the only way, I mean, if it's not charged under the gauge group, the only coupling that you cannot forbid at uh, up to the level of dimension four operators is the Higgs coupling. Yeah, so you have a coupling like that. So this is the Higgs doublet. And that's the only operator you can write down that is gauge invariant. And then after symmetry breaking, you will have a three-point vertex of the dark matter, dark matter particle coupling to um, the standard model Higgs. Yeah, so you have this kind of vertex, and then um, you have standard model particles here. Of course, you can have other kind of model building situations, but this is the most economic way you can um, achieve a WIMP uh, dark matter candidate. Now, so this is, let's say, this is a um, scalar particle, um, and think of this as, for example, the Higgs particle. So what does that mean? Yeah, if I have dark matter masses that are such that they are very close to the resonance here. Yeah, so the sum of the two dark matter masses is roughly the same as the mass of the scalar particle. Yeah, then, of course, the annihilation will be strongly enhanced. 
Yeah, but we know that the relic density scales like one over the annihilation rate. So in order to make up for that, I have to make sure that these couplings here are very small. Yeah, so these couplings here in a model like that, I cannot change. So it means that I should make the dark matter coupling, the one that I have freedom to change, make very small in order to get the correct relic density. So need very small G chi for the resonance situation. So yeah, in order to achieve the correct relic density. Yeah, but what does that mean? It means that the typical argument that kinetic decoupling is always later breaks down yeah, because the scattering process looks like this. This is my G chi, uh, G psi. Yeah, and if I'm forced at this parameter point here to make my G chi very small, then the scattering also becomes very small and I actually have very early kinetic decoupling. Yeah, and then it turns out that, in particular in a model like this, if you have a scalar, yeah, then this one here has a Yukawa structure. So that further enhances the effect because you're dominantly coupling to heavy standard model particles, heat bath particles, which however are suppressed. Yeah, so like the unsuppressed number density you only have for uh, relativistic particles, but then if the coupling structure here, like in this simple um, general case, prefers to couple to heavy particles, this one will give you an additional suppression. Yeah, so for the case of um, just this simple um, model here, yeah, this become, can become very relevant. Yeah, so if you um, take a parameter point close to the resonance, and naively calculate the relic density using the formula that everyone use, uses, you can get up to an order of magnitude in the relic density today wrong compared to fully solving this coupled system of equations. Yeah, so just keep in mind that there are relevant exceptions to this uh, equation here. Okay, any questions about the kinetic decoupling part? Okay, if not, then let's move on to the next way to produce dark matter, and that's by Friesen. Yeah, so, okay, let's again get back to our sketch, what we did so far. Um, yeah, for freeze out. This diagram is originally so efficient um, that it keeps the dark matter particles in full thermal equilibrium. So for freeze out, we have initial equilibrium with the heat bath. Yeah, and that means that, as we have discussed, Essentially that we have to make sure that the annihilation rate is larger or maybe even much larger than the Hubble rate. Yeah. Okay, but that actually is a requirement on the coupling strength you know, that I need to calculate the um, annihilation rate. Yeah. So that means that my um, coupling must be larger than some minimal coupling. If I tune the couplings in my model to very small values, then at some point it will not be possible to achieve this in the early universe. Yeah, so, and then for freeze in, yeah, I consider a situation where my couplings are much smaller than this minimal coupling. Yeah, so, in other words, I have a situation where I do have an interaction like that but that is not sufficient in strength to ever equilibrize the dark sector, the dark matter particles. Meaning that I will basically start with um, zero initial abundance, 
of course, that's a model dependent assumption. There could be some other production mechanism. Yeah, but let's say that after inflation, uh, we start with um, zero initial dependence of dark matter. And then for freeze out, of course, this process works in both directions. That's what defines equilibrium. But for freeze in, I will only have this direction. Yeah, so I will continuously produce dark matter from the thermal bath. Yeah, but I will never reach number densities close to um, equilibrium, to the equi equilibrium number density. Ah, and then I mentioned that I think already yesterday, for some reason, this is called a non thermal production uh, in many places, even though, of course, it's a production from thermal particles, so from the thermal bath. So that means dark matter never equilibrizes. Okay, so we can sketch this again in our plot here when we plot the co-moving number density as a function of our time parameter. Oh, then, okay, need some colors. So this is the equilibrium number density. Oh, so here roughly we have um, one. Yeah, so at very early times, it's, uh, um, it's just a constant, so it uh, only dilutes as the universe expands, and then we get an exponential Boltzmann suppression. And then for WIMPs, we had this situation that initially we are in equilibrium, and then we freeze out. Yeah, and then increasing the um, annihilation rate yeah, will keep us longer in equilibrium, and therefore the final number density um, goes down. So this is for increasing sigma v for waves. Okay, so now for these very weakly interacting or feebly interacting massive, massive particles, FIMPs, yeah, it's different. We start with an initial abundance that is zero, and then continuously produce from the thermal bath. Yeah, but at some point, this will stop. Yeah, so why is it that it stops? Well, here it stops because the number density of the dark matter particles is so diluted that they basically don't have a chance anymore to meet within a Hubble time. Here, the production is diluted because the um, temperature of the bath particles starts to approach the mass of the dark matter particles. Yeah, meaning that in order, just for uh, energy conservation, in order to produce a pair of dark matter particles, you have to sample from the exponentially suppressed tail of the, uh, of the heat bath particles. Yeah, so that means this also levels out, and that's referred to as freeze-in. Yeah, but for freeze-in, then, of course, if we increase the, the rate, yeah, we start from zero, but we would have a slightly larger slope. We still level off. Yeah, so that means that in the end, we get a larger dark matter abundance. Yeah, so This here is for increasing sigma v. For films. Yeah, you should get different colored chalks here. <laughs> okay, so what does that mean? It means that actually, even if we have a very simple interaction of this type here, yeah, so just two to two interactions, there are actually always two solutions to get the correct relic density. Yeah, so what we discussed so far was only one solution. We basically solved for sigma v being equal to the Hubble rate. Yeah, so that's one solution for the ratio of the, cross, um, of the coupling constant and uh, the mass, or the cross-section then. Um, but in fact, there's always two solutions. Two solutions um, to obtain the correct relic density. 
Yeah, so let's plot the relic density. Yeah, now as a function of the thermally averaged um, cross-section, or just as the cross-section, maybe. Um, yeah, well, let's do it like this. Yeah, so then you see that here it's a regime for very small values of the cross-section where the number density increases continuously, linearly, in fact, with the, um, the cross-section, like this. So this is proportional to sigma v. Yeah, and then there's a WIMP regime where it's inversely proportional. Oh, and then there's, okay, okay, this, this should be like the same angle. Sorry about my drawing. Yeah, and then there's a smooth transition about this. And then you can say that, I mean, for example, here is the actually observed number density. Yeah, so that means there are always two solutions that give you the correct number density for that, was, that is observed. Yeah, and that's a completely different regime. This one is, um, corresponds to relatively large couplings, yeah, so potentially observable signals. Yeah, and in fact, so observable that we've already excluded the vanilla version of this, um, of this mechanism. While this one corresponds to extremely small couplings, yeah, feebly interacting massive particles, where we have no hope to see this directly in any experiment. Another important difference is that um, this one here, yeah, so the WIMPs, um, they correspond to a scenario that are completely independent of initial conditions. Yeah, just because we thermalize, we wash out any, any, um, any sensitivity to initial conditions. Yeah, but here for the FIMS, yeah, there's, of course, an assumption that we make, namely, namely that we start with zero initial abundance. Yeah, we don't know anything about this. That's just an assumption. And if for any reason we start with a large abundance, from direct decay of the inflaton to dark matter, for, for example, yeah, this, this mechanism here would not be affected. Yeah, so doing a plot like that depends on the assumption that we start with uh, zero initial abundance. Okay, so let's again discuss this at a bit more detailed level involving the collision operator. So let's only look at the collision operator for the number density. Um, so then we have a phase space integral over all the momenta. Yeah, so remember, I always use the P's for the dark matter particles and K's for the heat bath particles. And we have momentum conservation. And, well, I assume CP invariance, so we've only one um, matrix element squared. Okay, and then we have um, well, this direction here, in principle. Yeah, so this uh, annihilation, so that is a um, no, sorry. No, really this production part. So that is proportional to the um, incoming densities, number densities or phase space densities of the standard model particles. And then in principle, we could think about um, quantum corrections in the final states. So F of E F chi of E bar, E twiddle. Yeah, and then, in principle, there's the opposite direction. Uh, but, so this is proportional to this one here. So F chi of E, F chi of E twiddle, and then 
f bar of omega f bar of omega twiddle. Uh, but then we already said that by assumption, yeah, we start with a very small amount of dark matter particles. So f chi is very small, yeah, meaning two things. Yeah, one is that we can always neglect the corrections here. So these f bars will just be one. And this, this process here, so the annihilation part, we can also completely neglect. So f chi is much larger, smaller than one by assumption in this regime. So f chi bar is one. Yeah, but these ones in principle are not equal to one. So these are relativistic particles. Um, and we also have only production. Yeah, so that means that this one we can neglect. Yeah, so that kind of defines um, the freeze-in regime. And then one has to be a bit careful. Yeah, so in principle, you would say that, oh great, now we can just uh, calculate this because we know this one here. Yeah, we know this is a thermal distribution. So you would say that, oh well, so let's use um, F of omega, F psi of omega, just to be the standard thermal distributions. Yeah, but there's something fishy with that argument. And the issue is that this form here is actually not covariant. Yeah, so you have this thermal distribution in the rest frame of the plasma. So it's a frame dependent statement. So this is only in the plasma rest frame. Yeah, so we have to somehow take care of that. Yeah, why didn't we have to take care of that before? I didn't even mention that. Well, in the case of freeze out, yeah, everything is in the highly non-relativistic regime. Yeah, and um, that means that um, it basically doesn't matter which frame you pick. Yeah, so you always, I mean, you, 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 you look at the annihilation of dark matter particles that are highly non-relativistic. Yeah, so that means that if you would, would, would uh, move to another frame where, you, where the actual center of mass energies are um, off, you would be strongly suppressed by the, um, by the exponential here. Yeah, so since everything is non-relativistic, you don't have to uh, worry about the frame. Here, it's different because we um, produce dark matter from relativistic particles and we do so continuously. Yeah, so all the time in the evolution we have to integrate over the entire cosmological evolution. So we really have to correctly into, take into account these relativistic contributions to the production. Now it turns out that there's a nice way to get around this or to reformulate the problem. Yeah, so first, let's notice that there's a math identity about these uh, things. Yeah, so, I mean, we already said that this one is just one. Yeah, so we want to look at this kind of product. And we can rewrite this. Yeah, we rewrite this by, I mean, typically, you get the most interesting results if you just add a factor of unity. Yeah, so we write this as f psi omega, f psi omega, twiddle. Yeah, and then we add a factor here, e to the minus omega plus omega twiddle by t. Now oh, I want to do this with a positive sign. Yeah, and then I add another exponentials, e to the e, over t and e to the minus e twiddle over t. Yeah, so first of all, why is that unity? Because of energy conservation. Yeah, so in each of these production processes, the energies of the initial states, uh, the sum of the energies of the initial states must be the sum of the energies of the final states. Yeah, so that's why this is just a factor of unity. Yeah, but then you see that this one here, and that's the reason I introduced it this way, this is just the Boltzmann distribution. 
Yeah, it's not a, an actual Boltzmann distribution, it's just mathematically, formally, looks like a Boltzmann distribution. So let's call this F chi Maxwell Boltzmann of E. And then you can um, well, play a bit with this expression. So you see that if you multiply this here with the exponential e to the omega, well, that's a very, very useful expression in any calculations that involve uh, thermal physics. You actually get f, f bar. Yeah, so that means that this is an f psi bar of omega f psi bar of omega twiddle, and then we have a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution of E and a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution of E twiddle. Uh, so, so far there's no physics, this is just math. <coughs> but then, I mean, if we realize where this term enters, namely here, then this has a very interesting uh, interpretation. Yeah? So, in the way the term enters, it's the production term of dark matter, like this. Yeah? But uh, if I rewrite this like this, this is how an annihilation term would look like if the dark matter distribution was okay, given by, uh, by the maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Yeah, so that means that the production of dark matter can be described by, a, by the annihilation of a would-be population with the Baxter Boltzmann distribution. So, production can be described by the annihilation of a would-be um, population of dark matter particles with a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. No. And yes. So someone Yes, exactly. 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 Oh sorry, 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 sorry. Thanks a lot for the question. Yes. When you do the set the matter identity, are you No, this is, this is, I mean, it's exact identities. So the only thing that I use is um, energy conservation. So I use E plus E twiddle equal omega plus omega twiddle. That's the only thing I use. So this is the same as this one here. So I just multiply with a factor of one. Exactly, and then I note additionally that um, f psi of omega times e to the omega of t, this is f bar psi of omega. This is also an identity, mathematical identity. We, we, can, we can look at this. Yeah, so, okay. so basically, just if you, if you multiply this factor here, this term here, with an e to the omega over t, omega by t plus minus one, yeah? then this is one minus plus f psi. Okay, so you that's an exact identity. Okay. And that's the nice thing of this formulation. <coughs> yeah, so there's really no assumption. The only assumption that enters is this one here. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so why does that help me? Because then I've mapped this to something that we've described before, right? So I can use exactly the same Boltzmann equation, exactly the same derivation as before. I just have to keep in mind that 
this one is not my actual dark matter density distribution. Yeah, but like mathematically, I get exactly the same formalism, exactly the same equations. Um, so this is, in other words, yeah, really for the annihilation, and then I have this Maxwell-Boltzmann density, like this. Yeah, so just to state that again, the n chi is the actual dark matter density. Yeah, and this one here is the equilibrium density of a would-be population in with a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Yeah. Okay, and what's the advantage? Well, I've said that already in words. There's a formal analogy <coughs> to the wind case. Yeah, so the differences are, A, there's only a production term. Yeah, in the WIMP case, there was an n chi squared minus n equilibrium squared. Yeah, and the other um, difference is that in the WIMP case, this production term with the equilibrium density squared is the actual equilibrium number density yeah, because we are in the non-relativistic regime. Here, it's just sort of a mathematical trick to rewrite the production term. Then... It's also another nice feature of this expression is that you can now, unlike in the WIMP case, just directly integrate it. Yeah? So note that the right-hand side doesn't actually depend on n, on the number density of particles. So you can directly integrate this equation over time or temperature. So this, this formulation allows a direct integration over T, so time or temperature. Yeah, so I should stress that this is not, I mean, the first point here is not just a sort of mathematical nicety, but it has like rather profound practical applications. Yeah, so typically freeze in production is described by an equation that looks like that just for actual production. And then of course you have the number density of standard model particles here. Yeah, and um, that is, of course, cl much closer to the actual physical situation. But the advantage of doing it in this way is that you can recycle all the like, highly detailed tools that exist to calculate um, freeze-out for WIMPs. Yeah, so in particular, like, all these very detailed and um, um, quite refined ways of calculating thermal averages, for example. Yeah, and then um, another point is that... Um, even the annihilation of dark matter particles. So to calculate this one, you only need to consider like one process, annihilation of dark matter to anything else. Yeah, so if we, for example, look at a um, um, annihilation via an S-channel resonance, like in the previous example, via an S-channel Higgs resonance, you can express this one here through the tabulated, I mean, even including higher order corrections, decay width of the standard model Higgs particle. Yeah, if you were to calculate the cross-section of the opposite process, you know, that would be much, much more work. You know, so that's a big advantage in practice. Okay, and then the final point is that um, here, I mean, even though everything looks the same, there's one more difference in that even though it doesn't look like this, we have actually taken into account the effect of um, quantum statistics in the now final state. Yeah? So quantum statistics in the distribution of standard model particles. So quantum statistics, or if you wish, finite T effects, <coughs> are taken into account yeah, by saying what we mean by this sigma v. Yeah, so, um, so this sigma v that I thermally average over, what is this? Uh, this is a um, just symmetry factor. So if you have um, um, different particles, yeah, so if, if dark matter is not its own antiparticle, this is just one. If it's self-conjugate, you have a factor of one over two. 
then we have an e, e twiddle, e three k two pi three two omega, e three k twiddle. Yeah, so the reason I write this all out is uh, that it hopefully rings a bell. Yeah, so this is really just the standard definition of the cross-section. Yeah, so in vacuum. Standard definition in vacuum. Yeah, so if you just look up the, uh, the way you calculate the cross-section from the amplitude squared, for example, in Pascal Schroeder, yeah, of course, you get this additional kinematic factor here compared to that definition. And if you wish, this is a way to define what we mean by the Muller uh, velocity. Yeah, but then there are in this definition corrections, namely factors that include the effect of um, the quantum statistics of the finite states. Yeah, so in that way, I mean, in the limit where we annihilate into a vacuum, these factors are just one. Yeah, but these factors are there. They are just typically not included in uh, like standard QFT books because we always consider um, like vacuum reactions. But the actual cross-section must take into account these factors. Yeah, so it's somewhat hidden, hidden in this way of writing it, but all of these effects are fully taken into account. Yeah, and numerically, when you calculate the relic density, they are important in the sense that they change the relic density results by order 20% or so, which you should compare to a 1% accuracy which we have in that observable. Okay, so now how does this relate to um, the cross-section and vacuum? Well, I mean, you know that in principle, like in, uh, in vacuum, the cross-section is only a function of the center of mass energy. Yeah. So how many more parameters do we need to describe these uh, final state effects? Yeah. And that's when this one comes in. Yeah. So you can't expect that it only depends on the center of mass energy because you somehow have a frame dependence here. But this frame dependence still has an O3 symmetry. Yeah. So the, I mean, is time or space is still isotropic, which means that in principle it must be possible to describe everything in terms of only one parameter that you can use, for example, to be or choose to be the, the Lorentz boost from the um, center of mass frame of a collision to the cosmic rest frame. Yeah, so it must be possible to write it like this, yeah, where this is the Lorentz factor in this transformation. And um, this is also the last thing that I want to write. Uh, you can indeed calculate this sigma v here, the thermal average for the annihilation explicitly, and you find the following expression. So remember that in the, in the WIMP case, we only had one integral over the rescale, the dimensionless center of mass energy squared. Yeah, and now we have an additional integral because we have to integrate over all Lorentz boosts. Of this cross section. Yeah, so this is the um, thermal average integral. And um, well, you can check that if there is no gamma dependence here, yeah, as you have in the highly non relativistic limit, or if you uh, annihilate into vacuum, so in other words, if you neglect this, the impact of these factors, yeah, then the only thing that you have to do is to perform this integral here, since sigma doesn't have a gamma dependence. And this is an integral that you can do analytically. Yeah, so it turns out that this is proportional just to the um, Bessel function of first kind. Yeah, so what you then find is the following. 
So this is for sigma s gamma to just being a function of s. And then we find this one. K1 to square root of x and to k2 squared of x times sigma of s. Yeah, and then maybe that is hopefully something that we remember. It's exactly the expression that is used in the standard one case, yeah, as expected. Yeah, so it's really just to stress that we have an expression here that fully takes into account all effects, quantum statistics, highly relativistic production, and still can formally be brought into a very simple form that can be directly integrated. Yeah, and you just have to perform like one additional integral in practice. Okay, that's it for today. See you again tomorrow. Um. I forgot to ask for questions, and Nicolau has anywhere. <laughs> yeah. You can do the same. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's slightly uh, more difficult because I mean, okay, here I completely neglected this part. Yeah, and that means that if I have this part, I can no longer directly integrate this equation. That's the complication. But in principle, you can do exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah, any other questions? Sorry. Okay, I'm also around the entire afternoon, so.